Our first scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Let us listen to God's word. When Jesus and his disciples had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our second lesson is from Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, and verse 18. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, ten years ago, my wife Rachel and I were preparing for a trip to Arches and Canyonlands National Parks out in Utah, along with her brother and, and his wife. Now, at some point in the planning process, my brother-in-law sent me an email asking if I'd be interested in a partial day excursion with him in which rappelling would feature rather prominently. Now, the, the fact that my rappelling experience could best be described as none <laughs> was, was not the first thought that entered my head. It was that this was an opportunity to appear much cooler than I actually am. <laughs> rappelling? Yeah, absolutely, I'm in. I, I, I rappel all the time. I rappel to work. <laughs> But all of my bravado vanished when months later I was staring down into a dark canyon that was called Medieval Chamber. <laughs> and I noticed that the precarious rope I would be clinging to seemed to vanish about halfway down in the darkness. It is a harrowing thing indeed to entertain a venture into the unknown, whatever it is. But the sense of being on the edge and, and looking down is where we find ourselves in, in both of these texts today, as the life of Paul and the life of Jesus converge on this Palm Sunday. We've been following the life of Paul throughout this series, and about 20 years have passed since Jesus first stopped him in his tracks on the road to Damascus and turned his life completely around. Since that dramatic experience, Paul had traveled thousands of miles by land and by sea. He had planted churches. He had mentored leaders. He had received warm welcomes. 
and he was also driven out of towns and faced all kinds of adversity. Here in 2 Timothy, Paul sounds keenly aware about what lies ahead. It's possible to situate these words from 2 Timothy to Paul's imprisonment in Rome towards the end of his life. He's on the edge between claiming an utter confidence in God, even as he describes himself as being poured out as a libation, depleted and spent. On edge is an apt description of Jerusalem as Jesus enters the city riding on a borrowed donkey and colt. The whole city was in turmoil, Matthew tells us, as hundreds of thousands of people would have flocked to the city for Passover. And along with the religious pilgrims, there would come an increased military presence as well, as it was a ripe time for unrest. And as Matthew describes the scene, you get the sense of how easy it would be to get caught up in the hysteria, to just get caught up in the excitement of the crowd. As, as Jesus enters, Matthew tells us that many cried out, Hosanna, but seemingly just as many cried out, Who is this? What, what are we yelling about? Who is this that we're cheering and welcoming? We refer to it as the triumphal entry. But on this side of history, we know what the subsequent days will bring. In concluding our series on the Apostle Paul, right as we enter Holy Week, I'm struck by the way Paul's story echoes that of his Lord. Both of them knew that returning to Jerusalem at that particular stage of their ministry and in that particular political climate of the day, would almost certainly mean their demise. And yet Paul, like Jesus, descended into the unknown with complete and utmost resolve. What we see here is Paul living out precisely what he had preached and taught precisely what he had sought to capture in whatever metaphor and illustration he could get his hands on and communicate to whomever would listen. The Christian life is the pursuit of becoming one with Christ. And here are just some of the ways Paul expressed that from his letters. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. For you have died, he once wrote, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We were buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. But perhaps nowhere more beautifully than this in the Christ hymn of Philippians, where he wrote, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name given to Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Christ, we see the pattern of the spiritual life in this world for all who would follow him. We cannot circumvent, we can't go around the brokenness of this world. We are called into it. And by the power of Christ, we get through it. And what this requires, friends, is faith. 
I learned pretty quickly that day when repelling that, that I could have mentally processed the instructions of the guide. I could even have believed them to be true. But unless I fully trusted that I would be held when I had to get my body perpendicular to the side of a cliff, I would bump, scrape, and crash my way down to the bottom. At its core, faith is trust. And faith doesn't change the circumstances around us, but it does enable us to navigate them. The last part of our excursion that day involved rappelling off a stunning feature called Morning Glory Arch. But there was a twist, I discovered. The description from the brochure read, and I quote, as we walk out on the middle of the arch, it becomes obvious that there are no anchors on top. Hmm. Time to find a partner. Next, we'll simply drape the rope over the arch, and you and your trusting partner simultaneously repel off opposite sides and counterweight one another. Yep, that's correct. Well, there's more to it than that, of course, but we'll discuss details in the canyon, smiley face. I mean, it sounds so fun and cute and harmless. But the lived experience was nothing <laughs> like that description. <laughs> I wasn't just invited to trust equipment, ropes, harnesses. I had to trust a person with whom I needed to be in step. Friends, the call to be faithful is a call to trust, but not a general trust that just we throw out wherever. It is trust in the God who is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And so however it is that we are on edge this day, whatever unknown into which we are peering this holy week, Know that Jesus has made the descent ahead of us. And he goes with us even now into our unknowns, inviting us and daring us to trust that we will be held and that we will get through. Amen.